We would like to welcome you to this webinar which will discuss polyethylene manufacturing and the properties of polyethylene resin. This webinar is presented by the Plastic Drum Institute PDI, and the Rigid Intermediate Bulk Container Association RIBCA. This webinar was originally presented by Mr. Paul Griffin of Lyondell Bissell, and we thank him for putting it together. The Plastic Drum Institute, or PDI, represents the manufacturers and suppliers of the North American plastic drum industry. Their mission is to promote the use of plastic drums and represent members before regulatory and legislative bodies. There are currently six plastic drum manufacturer members. The Rigid Intermediate Bulk Container Association, or RIBCA, fosters the interests of the persons, firms, and corporations engaged in the business of manufacturing or assembling rigid intermediate bulk containers. In today's session, we'll discuss the raw material, polyethylene, used to produce plastic drums and IBCs. Specifically, we'll discuss how polyethylene resin is produced with an overview on high-density polyethylene. Resin properties such as density, melt index, and molecular weight distribution will be explored. What is polyethylene? Polyethylene is a polymer that is made from the monomer ethylene. Ethylene, the building block for the resin, polymerizes and forms polyethylene. What is ethylene? The ethylene chemical formula is C2H4, a simple monomer made from a multitude of sources. Ethylene can be derived from natural gas liquids or refining. It may be helpful to review some basic definitions related to the manufacture and use of polyethylene. What is a monomer? A monomer is the basic building block of a polymer. Monomers are combined to form what is known as a polymer. A polymer is the combination of monomers. The process of joining monomers together to form a polymer is called polymerization. A co-monomer is a second type of monomer that can be added during the polymerization process. The main reason a co-monomer is added is to modify the resin's physical properties. Butene and hexene are commonly added co-monomers. This slide illustrates the different types of polyethylene. The types illustrated here are high-density, linear low-density and medium-density polyethylene, as well as low-density polyethylene. Polymers are classified based on their density. For example, high-density polyethylene has the highest density. High-density polyethylene typically is a very straight and rigid molecule with a very minimal amount of short-chain branching. Linear low-density and medium-density exhibit more branching and are slightly less rigid. Low-density polyethylene has a very high degree of branching and flexibility. How is ethylene produced? There are two main methods used to produce ethylene. The first method uses a natural gas liquid's feedstock. This method is primarily used in North America due to the abundant supply of natural gas. Natural gas is fractionated to remove unneeded components such as butane and propane. The ethane portion is subjected to a cracking process which results in ethylene. Ethylene, the building block of polyethylene, is sent to a polyethylene reactor for polymerization and formation of the finished product, polyethylene. The second methodology is mainly used in the Far East and Europe. In this process, the feedstock is typically naphtha, gas, oil, or similar refinery-based product. The feedstock is processed in an ethylene cracker, which results in ethylene. The ethylene is then polymerized in a polyethylene reactor to form the polyethylene. The final product from both processes is the same, and the choice is based on the availability of the base material, natural gas or refinery-based feedstock. This slide illustrates in more detail how ethylene is formed from ethane. Ethane is subjected to thermal decomposition and after ethylene is formed, it can be fractionated or separated into the various components and coproducts. The coproducts can be sold for other uses. Distillation and refrigeration, fractionation, is used to separate the various components, also called coproducts. 
The furnace and auxiliary components are designed to efficiently produce as much ethylene as possible and as few co-products as possible. Next, we will discuss the manufacture of high-density polyethylene resin, which is used in the production of plastic drums and IBCs. High-density polyethylene is made by polymerizing ethylene with a metal-based catalyst. If only ethylene is used, that resin type is called a homopolymer. This process results in a very long and straight chain of molecules as shown on the left of the slide. The high-density chain illustrated on the right of the slide is formed when a comonomer is added, forming short-chain branches. The short-chain branches result in physical properties such as improved impact strength. You may be wondering why a processor would choose a homopolymer versus a copolymer resin type. The choice depends on the stiffness and impact resistance desired in the final product. Homopolymers are more rigid molecules due to the straight long chain with no side branches. Due to these properties, the molecules can be stacked very close together. This results in a very rigid end product. However, the drawback is lower impact resistance. Conversely, short chain branching improves impact resistance but reduces stiffness. Generally speaking, high density polyethylene is used to manufacture rigid products such as pails, drums, and IBCs. As stated before, the addition of comonomer affects the density and stiffness of the resin. What causes this effect? The side chains disrupt the folding mechanism of the long chains lowering the resin's density and stiffness. Packaging manufacturers must balance the choice of resin properties in order to produce containers that can survive impact drop testing at cold temperatures and maintain the necessary stiffness. The comonomer most commonly used for polyethylene in drum and IBC applications is hexene. Next, we'll discuss the manufacturing of the polyethylene resin. Two of the most common processes used to manufacture polyethylene resin are gas phase and slurry loop. The majority of high-density polyethylene is made using a single reactor system. However, there are other processes, called bimodal or multimodal processes, which employ multiple reactors. Today, we are going to focus on gas phase and slurry loop processes. This slide provides a diagram of the gas phase process used to manufacture polyethylene. The process begins with treating ethylene and the other components before sending them to a reactor. In the reactor, which is nicknamed a matchstick reactor due to its appearance, the components or ingredients form a fluidized bed. You may be wondering, what is a fluidized bed? A good analogy would be powdered laundry detergent suspended in the air. The suspended powder is formed and then discharged as polyethylene powder. The powder is formed into pellets under heat and pressure by processing through an extruder, similar to the extruders used to manufacture drums and IBCs on blow molding equipment. During this process, various additives such as antioxidants can be added to the resin, which is then formed into pellets. This is a photo of a reactor used in the gas phase process. Next, we'll illustrate the slurry loop process used to manufacture polyethylene. Slurry loops can be vertical or horizontal. The slurry loop process is similar to gas phase in that the ethylene, catalyst, and other components are used to form ethylene powder. During the process, solids form in the suspension and are pulled off the loop. The carrier fluid is flashed off and polyethylene powder remains. The polyethylene powder is finished similar to the gas phase by forming into pellets. Other components, such as antioxidants, stabilization packages, and UV additives can be added at this time. This is a picture of the slurry loop equipment. Why would you use a slurry loop process versus a gas phase? Does one process have benefits versus the other? The reasoning behind why you would use a slurry loop process versus a gas phase typically comes down to licensing of the technology and familiarity with the technology, applications, or economics. Next, we'll discuss the key properties of various types of polyethylene. In this session, we'll focus on high-density polyethylene. 
There are many different ways to categorize the properties of polyethylene, but we'll focus on three key attributes. Density, melt index, and molecular weight distribution. With regard to density, resins are sorted according to type as follows. Low density, linear low density, medium density, and high density polyethylene. Density is expressed or measured in terms of weight per volume or grams per cubic centimeter. The amount of comonomer used in each one of these types influences the different densities. To some, the more comonomer you add, typically, the lower the density. High density polyethylene contains little or no comonomer, depending on whether it's a homopolymer or a copolymer. Medium density and linear low density contain more comonomer than high density and are therefore more flexible. The density of low density polyethylene is influenced by the high level of branching, similar to branches on a tree, reducing the polymer's density. Subsequently, the polymer is also more flexible. Next, we will discuss the relationship between density and crystallinity. Polyethylene is a semi-crystalline material. That means the resin contains amorphous, non-crystalline content, and crystalline content. The best way to describe amorphous content is a comparison to spaghetti noodles with long chains that are open. Crystalline content areas are more condensed. When you heat polyethylene, the crystalline areas break apart, which allows the polymer to flow. As the polyethylene cools, the crystalline areas reform and lead to the same amount of crystalline content and density. Homopolymers exhibit a high degree of crystallization and higher density. As comonomer content increases, the resin will exhibit more short-chain branching and subsequently lower crystallinity as well as density. How do density and crystallinity affect the properties of polyethylene? Polyethylenes with increased crystallinity or density tend to have increased stiffness. Conversely, resins with lower crystallinity or density are more flexible. Typically, lower density materials are used to produce flexible products, such as films and squeeze bottles. Higher density materials are used to produce more rigid products, such as drums, IBCs, and jerry cans. How do we measure a resin's density? This is a view of the density testing apparatus. The apparatus consists of a gradient column comprised of alcohol and water. Annealed resin is placed in the gradient, and the density is determined based on its position relative to a control bead of known density. Melt index is another key property of polyethylene resin. Melt index is best described as a measure of the viscosity of the resin, or the rate at which a polymer will flow when melted under standard conditions. The result is recorded in grams of flow per 10 minutes. The standard test protocol for melt index is conducted at 190 degrees centigrade at 2.16 kilograms of weight. A resin with a low melt index requires more energy to process due to its high viscosity or resistance to flow. Resin with a high melt index requires less energy to process because it has a low viscosity or a low resistance to flow. A good comparison would be water to syrup. The more a resin flows like water, the higher the melt index. Cold syrup doesn't flow as well when poured and would have a lower melt index. As illustrated here, melt index also reflects the chain length of the polymer in various resins. Once again, polyethylene can be thought of as a bucket of spaghetti noodles. The noodles are tangled or knotted together. When you try to pull out the noodles with a fork, it's difficult due to entanglements of long chains, which equates to a lower melt index. If you cut the noodles with a knife, they become smaller components. Thus, removing the noodles is easier as they flow past each other, illustrating a higher melt index. This is an illustration of the apparatus used to test the melt index of the polyethylene resin. The test is conducted in accordance with standard ASTM procedures and begins by loading the resin into the testing chamber, which is held at 190 degrees centigrade, to melt the resin. A calibrated weight of 2.16 kilograms is added to the test piston resting on the resin in the heated chamber. 
the weight begins to push the melted resin through a capillary dye of a specific diameter. The amount of resin that flows through the orifice during a specified time period is then weighed and recorded. The results are expressed in grams per 10 minutes. If a resin is extremely viscous, a high load melt index test must be conducted. This test uses a heavier weight of 21.6 kilograms in order to record the flow. In general, high load melt index type resins, nicknamed HLMI, are used to produce drums and IBCs due to the physical properties desired in these containers. The other key property of polyethylene, in addition to density and melt index, is molecular weight distribution. As mentioned earlier, chains can vary in length, long chains versus short chains. Molecular weight distribution quantifies the amount of each type. The left side of this chart shows the amount of short chains, while the right side of the chart shows the amount of high molecular weight chains, as well as everywhere in between. The overall height of the graph indicates the total content of each chain. If we compare the red curve to the blue curve, you'll note that the red curve has a broader molecular weight distribution and would contain a wider array of low and high molecular weight fractions. The blue curve, in comparison to the red, would have a narrower molecular weight distribution. Molecular weight distribution is one of the factors that determines how a resin is going to process. You may obtain resins from different producers, and they will behave differently due to molecular weight distribution, even though the density and melt index is similar. To recap, this webinar is intended to provide a high-level overview of polyethylene properties and how the resin is made. In addition, we discussed how to characterize the resins. The following are key takeaways. Polyethylene is a polymer compiled from ethylene, the building block of polyethylene. Some polyethylenes contain comonomers and are referred to as a copolymer. If the polymer does not contain comonomer, it's simply referred to as a homopolymer. This webinar focuses on high-density polyethylene, but there are other types medium density, linear low density, and low density. Each resin has pros and cons that suit specific applications. For example, high density is used when rigidity is desired. Gas phase and slurry loop are the most common production processes for HDPE. There aren't any pros or cons regarding process choice. The choice typically has more to do with licensing of the technology and familiarity with the technology, applications, or economics. Finally, the webinar addressed how to classify different types of high-density polyethylene as well as polyethylene in general. The three main characteristics discussed were density, melt index, and molecular weight distribution. Thank you for participating in this educational webinar today. If you have further questions, please email Susan Nauman, Executive Director, at snauman at industrialpackaging.org or Paul Griffin at paul.griffin at liondelbissell.com.